we were going to talk about the musical, both of us, because I actually had trouble watching it too. And I don't know if it's like the YouTube quality of the videos of the musical are hard when you you already kind of have trouble paying attention to things all the way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's like there, because the YouTube video, at least I think the one that we were watching was, um, it looked like it was a video that someone took of their computer of a video of it. So um, not the best quality. We can probably try to hunt down a better one for that purpose eventually, but. Um, we can watch it anytime. We don't have to watch it right now. Neither one of us really want to. <laughs> yeah, so um, we wanted to do an episode today about JK Rowling because we've talked about her here and there throughout our streams she's been kind of a um, point counterpoint to some of the things that rick does for us a lot of the time and so we wanted to put that all into one place for you know like for archive purposes for us get her having clips and also just because um she's showing her ass again with the olympics so yeah like truly the most epic fail of all time during the olympics being super transphobic accusing two women who one from algeria so african and one from taiwan who is obviously asian neither both of them born female accused both of them of being men when neither one of them are put them through all this harassment and both of them won gold medals in their competitions and yeah. <laughs> and like particularly the Taiwan, like Taiwan as a country, like was like really angry at her and was like harassing her a lot. Like she hasn't posted anything in five days, which I think is so funny <laughs> on her, on her Twitter account because she was like made a fucking fool. And so it's like, oh, you're being a transphobic monster, like threatening people with their safety who, who you think don't look like women that are actually women, but are just not white women let's go talk yeah. about her some more <laughs> so it's almost what's funny too is because she is upholding this white conventionally pretty standard of femininity and like she doesn't match up to it it's almost like the stuff that was happening with pearl where people yeah. are like okay so where's your husband girly <laughs> like um you know it's like you you don't look super feminine i would even argue that some of her personality aspects that we've seen over the decades of her being a public figure are not the most feminine the way that hermione was brought up as a character was kind of meant to be this feminist icon of like oh yeah girls can be smart and powerful too but um yeah she's this whole like turning it on people of color that don't look conventionally pretty, we could say, you don't look conventionally pretty. Should we think you're less of a woman? Also, like, you write books as a man. Mm -hmm. What is going on there? <laughs> that, like, you do this to people, but you write books as a man. So you're fine pretending to be a man in this context because you think people might read your books that otherwise wouldn't i'm guessing because i don't know why else she wrote under like a pseudonym except for that mm -hmm. but like when people feel like their gender is different than what they were born with that is somehow wrong and they deserve to die over it oh that's sure <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> sure and um i saw someone's video today where they were talking about the way that she's talking about these um these athletes it's setting the bar a different place than it was originally because she was very much like oh natal woman was the the words that she kept using mm -hmm. um and it's like okay here's two people who have female genitalia and now what's the new bar is it how much testosterone they happen to have is it how pretty they happen to be because then are we gonna have to do these weird like judgment calls i don't know it just it doesn't help the people she thinks it's helping. No, and it's also like, do you need, do I need now to like give somebody a blood test in order to use the women's bathroom? Yeah. Like, without you thinking that I'm pretending to be a woman, but I'm actually a man because I'm not feminine like that at all. And 
Like, I dress like this all the time. Like, I, I don't wear feminine stuff when I leave, when I do actually go outside. And so, like, that could, I could, like, fall into that category. She probably wouldn't do that to me because I'm white. But still, like, it's just the general idea of, like, you don't need to, like, how have we gotten to this place where you're, like, trans and like investigating people purely based on like their looks which just means that you don't think they look like white women mm -hmm. that's all it means at this point is that you don't think they look like white women because that's the only thing you have to base this on and especially considering how the uk is like exploding right now um that hasn't like the olympics has kind of made that not get as much attention but there's huge um, like neo Nazis are walking around in in the UK right now, just attacking not white people, um, and these huge fights and and like riots are like breaking out because people have been trying to warn them about that forever, but they haven't listened to us. But it's still like this is why people like that are doing that there because of people like her. And it's also a thing of like, do those people feel emboldened and decide to do this during the Olympics because J.K. Rowling ro like riled them all up? Because that's very possible because it's happening where she lives. <laughs> yeah. And I think I've even heard it said of these two particular athletes, like Taiwan and Algeria aren't the most trans friendly places. So like they wouldn't send somebody trans to the Olympics. Algeria is so fucking, like, they don't, like, gay, being gay is illegal still there. Yeah. And so, like, are you fucking kidding me that they're going to send a trans woman to, to play, do anything, much less boxing? Like, the Algeria, like, Twitter account has just, like, gone, like, as hardcore as possible about, like, oh, everyone just wants to know about our athletes' DNA, and apparently everyone was there when they were born, and things like that, and just being, like, like, assholes about it, like they should, to the ridiculousness of all of this but i guess the thing in context with what we talk about is um a lot of harry potter fans generally try to say that like oh you can still enjoy her books and like separate them from everything else that she does and even if you take away the fact that she uses her money to do this kind of thing to trans people even if you ignore that um you can't because it's in her story like her being a horrible person is why the harry potter books suck ass like yeah. when you actually look at the writing you can't you can't separate it anyway but like even if you wanted to you can't because it's baked into like the literal story of the harry potter has a slave he has an elf that's a slave like any he... and he... and you're supposed to agree with him that he's annoyed that the slave is like mad at him for having to be a slave and it's like are you you're mad that your slave has attitude <laughs> like <laughs> yeah well, what was the thing i heard someone say like we have harry started off at the beginning of the story kind of in a slave position in his family yeah. because he's being made to do housework he's not being allowed to join in the activity and he by chance gets allowed to join the activity that we get to see um but then one of i think it was even in the epilogue where like he talks about thinking, oh, I, I really want to go home and have a sandwich made by Creature. And it's just like, so, <laughs> so you're, you're just, just doing, okay with... you're yeah. just doing what the Dursleys did to you, to somebody. I would, oh my God. And I, I can at least speak on something like that because I was treated like that in a very different way, but similar enough, like different things I had to do, but similar enough things in like the, fa in my family. I would rather like burn myself alive than to like repeat that process. I spend most of my life terrified that I'm like secretly using somebody or manipulating them to do something that I want them to do, even though they don't want to do it. And I have like constant crises of yeah. faith about that. That is actually how most abusive, like uh, abuse survivors, especially child abuse survivors, that's usually how most of us feel. Mm -hmm. is that most of us are usually terrified of like accidentally falling into that pattern and we like question ourselves way too much <laughs> way too much constantly um but she like writes him as if she doesn't even i don't even think she, i honestly don't think she realizes that she even did that that yeah. she like made him 
start the whole process of like generational trauma over again. There's no way that she's aware enough to know that. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, and I do want to say I am still somewhat of a casual fan, but a fan in the sense that I don't like interacting with mainstream Harry Potter stuff. I mean, I, I went to Universal like two years ago. Okay. But like, you know, I don't like interacting with mainstream Harry Potter stuff. I don't like buying mainstream merch. Um, haven't played Hogwarts Legacy, but I still enjoy what the fandom does with this story because it was, it was unique in that people that are millennials and like that grew up with it, I think we knew it was problematic. And we also knew not only was there like problematic elements to the story, but JK Rowling wasn't the best author. There were so many plot holes or, um, weird jumps that we started filling those in as a fandom and like that's when fan fiction like for our generation was really really big was people writing their harry potter fan fiction to fill in the gaps especially during that three-year summer um just trying to you know like make this thing even bigger and better than it was but jk rowling as an author I, I don't know how you can see your fans start to do that and not start to look at some of the things they're saying and really think about them. And we talk about this being a big difference between her and Rick Riordan all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, I, I make this joke a lot with her, but legitimately the worst thing that she ever did was how long it took her to write Order of the Phoenix after she finished Goblet of Fire, because the end of Goblet of Fire, of course, is when Voldemort comes back, which is this like huge, moment where the story is now going to like progress and everything and so the harry potter fit like there were so many oh my god the amount of like fan things that were made during those years was like amazing like so much like fan fiction there were like we didn't have any of the technology we do now to make like pdfs and stuff but people made like giant like websites of like 20 30 pages of like huge amounts of just like analysis of what we thought would happen in the story going forward, there were so many different theories that people constantly talked about. There were fan fictions that people liked so much that people thought that they were like official Harry Potter books that people put out because they were so long and involved and people talked about them as if they were like official books. And so like, it was this whole huge thing. And like the thing that was bad about that is that when she started putting out the books, her books were worse than our theories. <laughs> because like we understood her characters better than she did. And we're not all horrible fascist little freaks. But like so many things just like never happened or happened in a really strange way. And and so it was just like I feel so and it was just the weirdest thing. I was like 17 when I read Goblet of Up to Goblet of Fire. And so I was uh, old enough to like and the group of people that was old enough to like look at these books and be like, yeah, there's like weird plot holes here and here and here and here. And here's like some ways that she could fix it. And then she didn't fix any of it. And we came up with better ideas, just like being like, you know, hyper focused kids that just like to talk about it all all the time on AOL Instant Messenger back in the day. And it was just so weird as those books came out and realized like how bad of an author she she actually was was and it was just that was the worst thing she ever did like it's always a bad idea when your fans come up with like better ideas than you do like we like speculating stuff about percy jackson and like the tv show i don't expect any of that stuff to actually be right it's just fun it's like fun to do and it's it's just fun to like do that stuff but like i don't expect to be right about any of that because it's just us having fun about the information we have now. And because I know that they know, I always say they're smarter than me and they're gonna come up with stuff that's better than what I, I, that I would think of. And they have so far. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's always a really bad idea when it's the other way, the other way around. And that's what it was with her. And it was like things that, like one thing that is like a fandom thing I can bring up that I remember from back then is one of the questions people asked a lot during that break and especially after or the phoenix came out too is like why do you keep making him go back to the dursleys and when the when or the phoenix came out the only way back then because there was no social media like at all yet 
No, not even Twitter was around then. Um, and so the only way that you could talk to like people like her back then was like fan, the biggest like fan website would have like a thing where you could send in um, like questions mm -hmm. and they would post them all, all of the questions, but they would be the one that would actually talk to her. And they would basically just put out like the transcription of like their, of their like conversation online or whatever. Like it wasn't even like the audio or anything like that. Cause that would have taken seven hours to load on, on the internet back then. And so she did one of those after Order of the Phoenix and people asked her about it so much that she said that she would explain it by the end of the series. And I have always thought like the only reason you even realize that this was a problem is because fans kept asking you about it because yeah. it bothered people so much, especially people like me who grew up in abusive families. We're like, why aren't you saving him from his family already for the love of God? <laughs> um, I should have known better when one of the videos we did on YouTube where I posted one of our things of where we were talking about Dumbledore and how abusive he is. I watched the clip for the first time in a million years of the very first clip of Dumbledore like ever in the movie when he's with like baby Harry and McGonagall's like these people are really abusive. Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure you want to leave this baby with like the worst people imag imaginable? And she's saying like, and she's saying like they're the and and then he cuts her off and says they're the only family he has left and i'm like i will punch you in the neck <laughs> i should have known back then that after saying something like that that they were never going to like free him or anything like that or even see that as like an option yeah and i mean so okay so as a plot device, the idea of every every year starts back at home starts like I do get that. Um, and Percy Jackson has it as well, because we have every every year kind of starts. He, it's the opposite schedule where he goes to school in the school year and then the summer is when the adventures happen. And so um, like the plot device that brings him back home is that he has a loving mother, you know? And, yeah. um, you know, no shade to Harry for being an orphan, but there is literally no tie to the muggle world for him once his parents are dead. As much as Petunia is one of the only living like relatives as in like blood relatives, um, I mean, Lupin was probably still about somewhere, right? And he was one of the marauders. He was somebody that was actually involved in Harry's life and probably met baby Harry. Um, and, you know, there was various teachers from Hogwarts who would have taken him in. There are so many people who would have taken him in because he's the kid who defeated Voldemort. Um, so like <laughs> this weird ancient blood love tie that she pulled out of her ass was just yeah. like, literally this is the best you could think of <laughs> like what <laughs> yeah and like when you even with percy jackson like there are times when that doesn't happen exactly the same way like formulaically like it does with her like the beginning of the of titans like we haven't started titans i just want to start titans curse at this point but like the beginning of that book is it's the winter after sea of monsters happened mm -hmm. And so like he, they're like at like a, a Chiron sent them off to like a, a private school to like rescue Nico and Bianca from that school. But it's only a few months after the last book we just read. It's not like a year later, he's not like back at school. And in that book, like Thalia and Annabeth are in New York at going to school there to like mm -hmm. stay closer to camp. And that is like a thing that consistently happens after that like that it's like well Thalia like leaves after that but Annabeth stays around and so even after that point when you reach like that like Titan's Curse is very similar to Prisoner of Azkaban where it's like the more serious tone book but like with Percy Jackson things do change even with that little stuff like yeah he still sees his mom but like Annabeth is now living in the same city as him and just going to a different school they're a lot closer to camp and things are happening more often. So they have to be around camp more. And, and like the last, it happens that way for like the fourth book and the fifth book too. Like they're still around camp all the time. It's just like an attack happens that like makes things suddenly per happen. 
and and it's not like he it's not like he keeps but yeah he has to go to school because he's a literal child and he's trying to graduate high school but it's not the same setup at all and it's just so weird to it the comparison i make is like if if sally would have stayed married to gabe like yeah. if like how, how it feels it like with him continuing to go back to the dursleys in every single book it's like why why like why does he do that um and it's just it feels backwards and it feels like it lessens the story and it just feels like it never goes past like the first point it should mm-hmm. and the way that literally every other ya book i've ever read usually progresses past that point very easily by like book two like can you imagine if sally stayed married to gabe Gosh, yeah. past book one like no that would be absolutely horrific but that's what she makes harry go through for basically no reason because it's like he constantly gets attacked at the dursley's house like he gets attacked by it's like that's like the thing that starts off every book is like he gets attacked by something when he's there so it's like is he even safe (laughs) when he's there like no No. yeah it's (laughs) It's a really lazy plot device for her to be like, okay, we've left the kids for a couple months, so here's how we're going to catch you up. Harry's been out of it, too, and he's been completely isolated from his friends somehow, so he also doesn't know what's going on. It's just very lazy, you know? Like, Rick can bring us into the middle of action, and we're like, oh, okay, this is what's been happening? Okay, let's see what else. Yeah, and even, like, with Percy Jackson, like, the kids aren't really allowed to use technology since they have like that thing that monsters could find them that way but even with that like percy and annabeth when even when they live across the country from each other they still talk when they're not in school like in between the first and second book they like email or like write letters to each other um but they still talk and stuff they have a phone (laughs) like they still talk because they're still friends and so the whole weird thing of like keeping the abused child who is also the one that is supposed to save everybody in the dark is just like this is like the worst setup in the entire world for what you're forcing like your hero to go through like everyone knows more about his entire life than he does and nobody will tell him anything and there's legitimately not a good reason to keep it from him like there's they keep like the end of the prophecy from percy but it's like we don't want you to know for years on end that you might be stabbed to death like that's like a nice thing to not want to tell a 13 year old kid that he might be stabbed to death in three years yeah. and like, like with like harry potter it's like no we don't want you to know that you are going to have to sacrifice yourself because then you might like figure out a way to stay alive and then my entire plan will be ruined yeah it's it's very weird it's like you're going to have to go up against this bad guy, but we're not going to prepare you at all. We're going to let you think that other people can be involved in this fight too. But no, it has to be you. Ay, ay, ay. I mean, so this is something worth acknowledging. And I know I've brought it up a few times here and there, but there are par- parallels to the story. We have a main trio. We have a main trio with the same gender ratio. Um, with like a smart girl, a Leo lead man, um, you know, and um, this like separation between mortal world and magical world that like it's other kids. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because if you were to take like even say Rick was extremely inspired by Harry Potter, he still did it better. I mean, he still, <laughs> his magic makes more sense. His like world building makes more sense. His characters make more sense. And that's why when we're taking them out of the book and making them three dimensional right now, they still make sense because it's still Rick, you know? Yeah. And I don't think you can ever say that he was inspired by Harry Potter. It was more like, because he was writing books when Harry Potter started coming out. Um, It was more like children's, children's books, like children's media like this wasn't really being published in that time. Um, And so when Harry Potter came out, all of a sudden that became like a viable publishing thing again. Yeah. And so it was like, oh, so if I write my 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 story that I'm writing for my kids and publish it, somebody will actually do that now. And so that's like and I am sure, like we've said before, that like 
certain things in the history are probably like that, like the trio being the way that they are and things like that, to be close enough to Harry Potter to like make it easier to be to get him like a five book deal to be published and stuff like that, or they had him do that just to make it easier to get kids to read it or something. But yeah. other than that, like everything ends after that, like it's an actual good story. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the fandom doesn't need like we write a lot of fan there's a lot of Harry Potter not Harry Potter there's a lot of Percy Jackson fan fiction out there yes because it's always fun to like write with like the characters that you love but the fan fiction is like a fun exploration of the world because we don't need to fix anything we're not yeah. we're not writing it to fix anything like he spent I don't even know how long a really long there was a, like a 10 year break between when he put out books with like Percy as like the lead and like nothing happened <laughs> in in those 10 years. It wasn't like the fandom was suddenly like, oh, Rick Riordan's writing isn't that good anymore and I don't like this, this story. It was more like the TV show started and we all went back and read it again and we're like, I love these books so much <laughs> and I love them more now in a different way now that I'm much older than I was when I first read them for the first time. Yeah. that's like the way that you want to feel and that's what he's that's the reaction that that percy jackson fans are having which is why all of this is so much fun and harry potter fans are constantly just arguing with people <laughs> to like like it's crazy to to remember where harry potter started and that now it's become like an argument of like no i promise i'm a good person i just like these books sometimes yeah <laughs> that's what it's become like you have to like explain like your morality like are you secretly a neo-nazi like you have to tell me this right now before i will continue talking to you but that's like what it's become <laughs> and it does seem like the majority of people who are still in it in the fandom that are like our ages are the people who did heavily like write or engage with um fan fiction because that's more what they're attached to. They're not necessarily attached to the main story. They're attached to everything that fandom was able to pull out of it and resuscitate. Yeah, like I always tend to say that I love the character of Harry Potter, but I like love the character of Harry that he should have been able to be if JK Rowling would have let him be that person as opposed to who he actually is. Like, Harry Potter in the series, she made him an abusive dad who ends up a cop. Um, no, <laughs> that's not at all like who I thought he would be, who, who anyone thinks he should be. Nobody thinks that Hermione should end up like a, a maid or something alone for the rest of her life if she never got married to Ron. Like she wrote in that horrible book that we all try to act like never happened um and all the other things that she said about all of them and, and stuff it's just it's so weird to watch a fandom where the fans have a better idea of who the characters are than the actual author and the author is such like a little egomaniac freak that she won't listen to anything that we say yeah so people like i <laughs> i will never get over how after years years and years and years of her personally bullying harry and hermione fans like her personally saying that we were delusional that we like incest like do you know how much that hurt me that she said oh, i like God, incest yeah. because i like the characters of harry and hermione and their wonderful friendship and think that their friendship makes the most sense out of every character in this book series to eventually turn into romance if it does because they actually love each other and don't treat each other like shit like mm -hmm. hello you're the one who wrote them that way but she seriously harassed us forever and then for all of that to happen and then years later she admits that we're right the entire time like are you kidding me you you could have just realized this when you were writing these stupid books like there was, there was so much harassment. Like, imagine like just like a fan, how fandoms are, and how much fandoms argue about different shifts, particularly. Just imagine what it would be like if like the creator of the thing, like co-sign making fun of you. Like literally, everyone just ganged up on us everywhere we went, and called us delusional, and said we liked incest, and said we liked brothers and sisters dating, 
and because of what she said it was a horrible experience and it was like it's fucking unbelievable that after all of that you were like oh you were right the whole time and it's like no fucking shit we were you stupid idiot but like why did you put us through all of that like rick riordan and like granted his wife becky who runs like the mytho magic account on tiktok and threads and stuff they would like literally start a fight <laughs> if like somebody was being mean to somebody else they're very protective of their fans and they want them all to have a really nice time and they get like it's they just sound like teachers that are very disappointed in you whenever anyone does something that they don't like and they call it out immediately they would they would never make anybody feel like that and it's just bonkers that she did that yeah, so she's had such a weird relationship with her fandom, and I know you're a little bit more up to speed on it because you were in it a little bit more. I, I, I said this before, I didn't read the Harry Potter books until after the seventh book came out, and everybody at school was already saying what happened at the end. Um, that's what got me to read the entire book series, so I didn't have to do the three-year summers. Um, like, I, I didn't have to do all of that my first kind of interaction with the fandom and i still can't find it is a stupid facebook game that had a chat feature i'm still so driven crazy by this it, <laughs> it was a game that came out around the same time as um order of the phoenix wait was it order of the phoenix it was the one that has dumb um umbrage in it because there was no, a yeah there was a game where it was like her cat plates and you had to like shoot things at the, the plates and then there were a few other games that were surrounding it on facebook and then yeah there was this chat and that was the first time i interacted with other fans of a book series where they were like we want to debate about topics uh that like we can talk about with harry potter like is he an actual good hero or is he just lucky um mm -hmm. you know things like that um so i wasn't reading like fan fiction i wasn't going out and finding it but i that was my first experience interacting with a fandom <laughs> yeah <sighs> and so jk rowling has she has probably so many ships in her fandom like in the harry potter fandom that she's had to go up against there's Dramione, there's people that ship harry and snape there's like there's really fucking weird ones right yeah um, and I mean, Jermione is probably like the only one that for me, I'm like, really? Like, okay, how? well, one thing I can say is that if you want to know why Draco and Hermione and Draco and Harry and also Draco and Ginny, although that was a fun, that was a more fun one, but Draco and Harry and Draco and Hermione, it's Cassandra Clare's fault that those two ships exist like they do um like literally her it's literally her oh she, my gosh. she wrote the her and another author were both writing huge fan gigantic fanfic the ones that i mentioned before that people when you're new to harry potter fandom you thought that they were like official stories because everyone was like everyone read them and talked about them as if they were of like official because we would talk about them so much she wrote um a Harry Potter fanfic. I forget what it's called. I think it was called Draco Dormians. I didn't read it because I don't like Draco. And so I didn't want to read a, a fanfic like centered on him. But she did those ships in that story. And that story was so huge that it became like a popular ship in the fandom after that. Okay. And Cassandra Clare is a horrible fucking bitch just to like be honest about it. Like I've had. It's especially clear. <laughs> yeah, like I've had a huge. Anyone who remembers her from back then has a huge like chip on their shoulder. I will never, I, I will hate her forever because she not only plagiarized entire chapters of her fan fiction that she was writing and people back then somehow figured it out. It was so hard to figure that stuff out back then when the internet was so slow and there was like no search databases like we have now, but people figured it out. And when people started figuring it out and talking about it, she like openly harassed like teenagers. She was, she's old. She's like older, much even older. I'm 39. She's like in her like late 40s or early 50s or something. She was like 35 writing fan fiction about Harry Potter that like a bunch of teenagers were reading. And she was like 35 and spending money to harass like 15, 16 year old kids mm -hmm. because they figured out that she was plagiarizing every single chapter of her fan fiction. 
And why was she, why did she get a publishing deal? Why? Like, I seriously wish that somebody could have been there to like watch me when, because I remember in like 2008 or something like that, my mom took me to Barnes and Noble to like, just look at books or whatever. And I walked in the bookstore and I saw like her first Mortal Instruments book with her name. And I yelled like, what the fuck in the middle of Barnes and Noble? And my mom was like, what? I'm like, how is she published? She steals all of her stories. Like, I know that this story is stolen from somebody because she, if she can't even come up with a good idea on her own for fan fiction, she's not going to come up with one writing for herself. Yeah. I was so mad. Every time I see her, I just cover up her books with something else. Um, but that ship is definitely for her. But there are things like that in, like, every fandom. That's part of the fun of fandom is just, like, pure creativity that we all engage in together that is very separate from like the canon of like the show or the books or whatever that you read or, or watch it's not supposed to be ever can't it's supposed to be just like fun playing and mm -hmm. things like that but um she was like she jk rowling was very mean about all of that stuff she like went after fans who wrote gay stories <laughs> yeah. and uh, and saw and thought that they were like explicit and it was like there's so much fan fiction about straight people having sex all over this fictional high school um i don't want to read any of it but i kept finding it anyway that's just part of like trying to find fan fiction when you're also terrified of reading about sex you just end up finding it everywhere you go but she didn't say anything to any of the writers writing all of the like straight or whatever couples but it literally sent a cease and desist letter to a website that because back then there was no like AO3 or even fanfiction.net. So everything was on like a separate website. If you liked like a certain pairing, there were certain websites you would go to. And on those websites would be where all the stories were written. And so she sent one to a website that wrote Wolfstar, which is, who is that again? Like Remus and Sirius mm -hmm. and threatened to sue them if they, she didn't actually sue them because she's not that crazy, but um, they put up protections. But the reason she said they, they, she did that is, oh, so kids don't like stumble across these stories. That was not physically possible on the internet back then. Like, it's hard to describe that for like how the internet is now, but Google was like a brand new thing back then. Like I can remember my teacher when I was a sophomore in high school in 2001, telling us what Google was and explaining what a search engine even was. And, and so when this happened, like they didn't like collate things the way that they do so easily now and so there was no way that like authors weren't like writing explicit like crazy like stories with tons of sex in it and not warning anybody that there was tons of sex in it they would put on the top that it was like you know the age level or like what was in it or whatever and so even if a kid found a website like that they would be able to tell which ones had what in it and so the like whole moral panic that like kids are going to be horribly hurt by the internet back then by seeing like by like reading about gay people having sex when they're in love it's like there was literally people like just grooming us <laughs> in like aol chat rooms and that's things like that but like, that's what you're worried about yeah it was literally easier for us to stumble upon mainstream porn than it was like smut fan fiction yeah, that was back then when people just started posting like literal porn like mm -hmm. not even like actual porn they were just like posting it all over whoa all over the internet and like I, that was terrifying for me i was like oh my god what do i do i just i like didn't go on like when youtube was youtube was created to post a porn movie <laughs> and that that's the reason why that website even exist I didn't use YouTube for like years because I was terrified every time I went on it that I would end up like finding like a hardcore porn like something because there it was just like a free for all until Google bought it thank god <laughs> and they like stopped people from doing that but the internet was very like wild like that back then where you would just find that stuff people would just post that stuff and there was nothing out there to like stop people from doing that because it was nobody, none of the corporations yet had figured out how to like monetize that sort of thing yet. Like that technology didn't exist yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so like 
there really was no reason for her to do that but to because she hates gay people <laughs> yeah it was to shut down all of the ships she doesn't agree with and i don't even think i'm exaggerating by saying she hates gay people or just doesn't like them obviously look at what she does with us now um but even back then it was just obvious that she saw gay sex as somehow bad or ugly or scary or explicit in a way that other sorts of sex isn't mm -hmm. and it's just like why does only this one kind bother you this is super weird and especially considering her stories <laughs> even back then i remember people talking about the names that she gave people like that cho chang is named cho chang and she is the one asian character in her entire book and she's basically an over dramatic little weirdo that you're that nobody really likes <laughs> um like i felt so bad for the asian fans they like she was all they had and they like tried to they wrote so many stories to try to like redeem her because she made her such a little just annoying in like the strangest way like you didn't need to do that i will never get over that the there that there's a black character with the last name shackle bolt <laughs> and just so many characters like that with their names that i'm just like how is this real <laughs> like yeah. i can't even imagine you might as well name him like steve i was a slave <laughs> and just like skip it like it's honestly wild to me that like jk rowling and rick Barton do the same job like yeah how is how is that even possible <laughs> that you <laughs> black mold <laughs> <laughs> but you both do the same job meant for like the same core audience mm -hmm. and you somehow like did this like oh my gosh i don't i can't even imagine like him ever he would never do that anyway um because he yeah. had like a soul and everything <laughs> and really likes everybody um and yeah. like but it's still just like wild to think about all of this stuff or just I don't know compare how they've ended up like I, I know a lot of Percy Jackson fans say this but it is true that Rick Riordan is who everyone thought JK Rowling was when her books were coming out and it's just funny how that happened like I honestly think that Percy Jackson kind of won like the imagined race between all of the different YA things that were coming out during those years by just like having a writer that actually had a coherent story like really good character development that like stood the test of time and so we just kind of had to sit there and wait and like just by existing for a long time we just kind of waited everybody else out and like all the other stories fell apart or jk rowling turned into a horrible fascist <laughs> and and rick Riordan just stayed who he was and eventually just as more time went on people just realized like oh these stories are great and oh Rick Riordan is really nice <laughs> and like takes critique from his audience and writes a lot of diverse characters and and like casts a bunch of diverse people in his TV show and is very supportive of all of his fans and literally came up with an entire imprint of books just so people can like write books about their mythological stories that usually don't get published because mm -hmm. publishing is so white focused like he literally came up with an entire imprint just for that <laughs> just to like help diverse authors get published more and used his name so it would happen faster like i can't even it's so weird to think about how they're how they both ended up in the same place or like at one point and ended up here yeah i, I can speak on that a little bit too as someone who was very into classics um, because like as as that little girl in high school who was editor in chief of her paper and taking Latin, that was the comparison was like, oh, do you want to be like JK Rowling one day? And of course, you know, like 18, 19 year old me was like, yes, I do. I, I want to write this like franchise that changes people's lives that is like great. And I would love to somehow incorporate that love of latin classical mythology <laughs> that stuff into it like that was that was the dream you know and then rick riordan actually did it like rick riordan <laughs> he wrote these books that not only take the mythology that i loved but like for me it feels like he gets it it feels like he understands the mythology he understands the spirit behind it and he's having fun with it like 
that's so apparent. Um, yeah, the teacher vibe, it extends beyond, you know, like, I wrote these books and I want to teach you these things because I would even venture to guess that when he sees good fan fiction of his own work, he's like, oh my gosh, this is great. Like, how mm -hmm. can I, how can I incorporate some of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he, like, even the blog he wrote, like, calling out every racist person and to defend Leah, it was, he was being a teacher in that blog. He was literally teaching them what being prejudiced means, what being racist means, and things like that. Like, he, that's how, he always comes at things as, like, I'm trying to teach these kids something, um, as opposed to whatever the fuck JK Rowling is doing. Um, and like, the thing that I think is so crazy is the thing that like made me feel super betrayed a couple years ago about JK Rowling is when the story came out, I really liked her in the beginning because the story that she told was that she was in an abusive relationship that she romanticized with Ron and Hermione in her book, <laughs> um, where, but like they got divorced. She was like, she was like living with her family and she was like really poor and didn't have any money and just went to like a coffee shop every day and started writing Harry Potter. And that's like where the story came from. And it was just like this nice belief for me as like an abused kid that was super poor my entire life. Like the idea that like somebody who is that poor could like end up, you know, get that far. It was like nice for me to believe I needed stuff like that to believe in back then. And so I felt super betrayed gigantically betrayed a couple years ago when I found out that was all a lie that she was living with very rich relatives she had mm -hmm. and so like even if she didn't have a job at the time because she left her husband she had money like they she lived in a big house they paid for all of her stuff they they paid for all of her food they gave her money for her and her daughter to live on like so all of her basic needs were being met. She didn't have to worry about anything. And so she had the time to sit in a coffee shop and like write Harry Potter because they gave her all the money she would need to survive. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God. Like, so the story about you was never even true from the beginning. And you just made it sound like you were like a poor person who somehow made it in publishing to get people to like you more, I'm guessing. And like, ironically, Rick Riordan and his, and like Becky, his wife were actually pretty poor. <laughs> like they lived it when they were first married, they lived in San Francisco mm -hmm. and they had their, their two kids when they lived there. And Becky stopped working when they had their first kid and he was a teacher. Can you imagine living on San Francisco with two kids under the salary of one teacher? You, yeah, um, you'd either be living in a really shitty part of San Francisco or you'd have basically nothing. Yeah, and they basically did have nothing. And like, he doesn't talk, he talks about that sometimes when he's like telling on like his blog sometimes. You can find him talking about like, you know, when he first got the idea for Percy Jackson, when he first started writing it, things like that, or just like his teaching experience when he's talked about it before, or he'll just mention things like that, but he's not talking about it in a way of like, you should like me because I was poor once. He's just, it's just his life. So he's just talking a little bit about his life. And he's saying like, yeah, we lived in San Francisco for a while. That's where I, I met a lot of like kids that were gay and, and queer in different ways and trans and stuff like that. We couldn't stay there because we were too freaking poor. And so we ended up moving back to like Texas where they, you know, grew up because it's a lot cheaper to live there. Mm -hmm. um, but like that he's just talking about his life he you would never know that about him like he doesn't really talk they don't really talk about their life like that they don't if you don't know like i didn't know that that like percy and annabeth are based off of him and his wife until like the show came back because when i first read the books i never i couldn't find information about him and in the last 10 years or so he's talked a little bit more about that stuff but like he doesn't put stuff out about him to try to get you to like him. Mm -hmm. He just talks about that stuff when people ask him about it in interviews, but he doesn't use it as a way to like try to get you to read his stories because you don't need to do that when you just have a good story. And honestly and truly, if you want to understand Rick Riordan and his life, just read his books. <laughs> like, 
because because it's all in there like his his parents got divorced he was much closer with his mom than his dad his dad is not really around you would know that by how Percy is mm -hmm. like it's very obvious to see like where a lot of his stuff or the way that he talks about teachers being monsters that's a good way of showing like what his kids went through when they were little and they were neurodivergent trying to deal with school yeah so everything that you would want to know about him you can pretty much figure out just by what happens in the story some of the time anyway um in a good way <laughs> like, the day if the jk rowling like tragic backstory was drummed up because that was that was the big Oprah time, wasn't it? Like the you like have a car, you have a car, you have a car. Like it was that point in time, wasn't it? So um, like they probably did that because that's commercially what people loved at the moment is like an underdog story or a story of overcoming extreme circumstances. And yeah, like it wasn't really necessary for anybody to like this story because even when she was just living in the ambiguity of jk rowling no idea which gender no idea who this person is it was doing good it was doing good before she started doing like press tours and stuff well and the thing from back then too that's good to keep in mind is that back then people didn't know anything about public figures of any sort like yeah. That was one of the wildest things being like my age watching that happen with the internet. But um, back then it wasn't until, I don't even know when, when like Twitter probably started in like 2000, like 2010 was when people started using Twitter a lot. It like started in 2008, but hardly anybody was on it back then. And nobody really knew what the hell we were even doing with like, no one knew what social media really was, but yeah, it wasn't until like around then that like all of a sudden they're sort of being like paparazzi there's always paparazzi around certain celebrities but they could very easily like cover up things that were happening in their life mm -hmm. and you didn't really know anything about them unless they shared it with them your themselves and it wasn't like how it was now where like people know when like a, a couple breaks up because they like stop following each other on social media or the story just like leaks out because there's like gossip websites that exist just for that none of that stuff was going on then you didn't know anything about what was going on with it. like there were celebrities that would go to rehab and you would have no idea like when um when robert downey jr was an addict and he kept going in and out of rehab and stuff people would find out that he was in rehab because there were sometimes paparazzi would like take pictures of him looking like an addict or something or he would put out a story about after he got out of rehab to try to get somebody to give him an acting job again mm -hmm. but other than other than them like sharing that information with you you didn't know anything about public figures the way that we do now and yeah. so like they had to purposely decide to share that and i think that it's because they were like well i want they wanted people to think that she was like a nice underdog story it's not as fun to like see this wild success and then find out that it's basically somebody who just had connections with the right people who already came from like a well-off family like people know now that a lot of people end up that way like rick riordan being a no very normal person mm -hmm. and even like walker scobell the actor being a very normal person that did not live in hollywood was not connected to the industry at all it's very rare for them to have success in hollywood now and everyone knows that now but at the time, we didn't know that back then. And so they purposely chose to share that with everybody to try to get us to like her more. And like in retrospect, that, <laughs> that would have been like the first red flag of like, why are you, what are you hiding? Yeah. That you're putting out a story like this to try to get me to like her. And there must be something really bad um, about her that you're trying to like cover up. But like, we didn't even know to think about it in that way yet. Yeah, like uh, people talk about Nepo babies all the time now. We didn't know that actors were related to each other until like Google was a big thing. Like most of the time it was maybe you knew a couple of them like Joan Cusack and John Cusack, but like it, a celebrity could have a whole ass twin that wasn't famous and we'd be like, what? But yeah, we would have no idea. Or like the, a crazy version of that is just how like even the most wild kind of scandal stories um i honestly love social media for this because 
the only way that you heard about anything was like through the like the national kind of news sources and they always would have like an angle of whoever was giving them money basically and so that was the only way that you learned about those stories though and so until social media existed where we could all like talk to each other and we realized that like a lot of us didn't agree with the certain way they were putting things but that didn't happen forever like i remember um the one that like (laughs) like very severely traumatized me actually when i was a kid was i remember when i was like 11 or 12 and the big news story at entertainment tonight every night was about woody allen marrying his stepdaughter yeah and the way that they put him marrying his stepdaughter was that mia farrow was like a jealous jilted ex-wife for being upset about it yeah and that that's literally how they framed it every single night and me watching that i was like oh so if i talk about what's happening to me nobody will believe me and they'll take like his side got it and so i never said anything to anybody after that because that's very obvious like from watching that every night, that's literally how they would say it. Like they acted like she was being an overdramatic weirdo mm-hmm. for being upset at him when he was marrying his stepdaughter and obviously had like done horrible stuff to her in order for that to happen. And yeah. it's like, and like people were un- actually mad at her about that. Like there's like websites, you can find those magazines and stuff at the time where people were saying that, but that like entertainment tonight, would talk about that story from that sort of perspective. All of the, all of like the cheap tabloids would talk about it from that perspective. And so that was the only story that you heard. And so people just like basically got like manipulated into believing that without, without thinking, except if you're somebody like me who just like thought these things in my head and never shared it with anybody (laughs) that I disagreed and just sat there and like waited for society to like catch up where I could finally start saying those things out loud. (laughs) Like, that's generally how it was back then. And so she definitely was trying to get people to think that she was a really nice, just like single mom from the beginning, um, when that was never who she actually was. And it just honestly kind of concerns me to like wonder what she was like with this stuff, with all the like hateful stuff back then. Like what stuff she was doing like that back then that we just didn't know about because there was no way for us to know. Yeah, because for people like us, it really did come out of left field when she was transphobic. All of us thought that like the entire series felt like a metaphor for queerness when we first read it of just like a kid who literally lives in a closet who has these magical abilities and can't be himself at home. Like that, that speaks to queerness so much. So for all of us who were believing this media fed lie about JK Rowling, that she was an underdog and an abuse survivor and all of these things, like it really made us want, want the win for her. It made us support her more. Even, even when we started to look at things and be like, oh, this doesn't really make sense. Um, there were subtle hints. There really were, but it was so hard to get until we got the full picture. And then it was like, oh, you're a bigot. Okay. (laughs) It's still like, it's still wild for me to remember how all of that came out. Like for anyone who doesn't know, it essentially was like she, back in like 2013, 2014, I think, 2015, somewhere, somewhere in those years, it may be a couple years later, whatever. She was on, she was on Twitter as she is. And people just like noticed that she liked a trans, a very transphobic tweet. Mm-hmm. And people asked her about it, and she said, oh, I, I didn't mean to like that. That was an accident. And then a couple months later, she liked another one, and people were like, wait a second, what are you doing? You're liking the same thing again. And then the, cra- <laughs> the craziest thing that happened was the time when she was trying to respond to, like, a fan that was, like, a little kid who drew, like, a picture of something in Harry Potter and she accidentally copy and pasted this like diatribe she wrote that was like a super transphobic hateful just like rant in response to this like seven year old child on accident she just copy and pasted it and hit like post before she realized what she wrote and that is how everyone found out how horribly like transphobic she really was by her outing herself Mm -hmm. on, on twitter by just not knowing how to use twitter um, but that's like how every, after that, everyone was like, oh fuck. And like some Harry Potter fans tried to like gaslight themselves into believing 
that she wasn't because she was still trying to deny it then mm-hmm. after that after she it was a little while after that that she just like stopped denying it and just like went full on just like villain like she's been ever since then but it was like a very like slow and steady process like yeah that was wild like i didn't like her for a long time and for it was like not allowed you were not allowed to say that um mm-hmm. like i talked about this with you when like the kendrick lamar songs were coming out but one thing that autistic people do is that we have opinions about things because we have our pattern recognition stuff happening or whatever but we know enough about society to know that nobody is going to agree with what we have to say and so we just like have these things in our head and we just like know that they're true and we just say nothing sometimes for like 20 years and we like have an entire like rant like saved in our head the entire time that we update as more time goes on and we're just like waiting for the moment when we are allowed socially to publicly say this and know that people will agree with us mm-hmm. and that's what i did with jk rowling is i just waited until people finally caught up to how shitty of a person she was and then i was i remember like on my for my twitter account that's now gone being like oh thank god i can talk about how big of a fucking bitch jk rowling is now <laughs> like after so long of not being able to say any of it without getting immediately attacked and saying that I'm a horrible person for thinking that about her. (laughs) Everybody loved her before that. (laughs) And I wonder if what she copy and pasted ended up being part of her manifesto. I think it was from something like people search for like the text and it was from like a super, super transphobic like article or something like that, that somebody else had written. And so it was like she did that, and then there was a situation in the United Kingdom. It was somebody named Maya, is all I can remember. And it was somebody who in the UK was doing the thing about women, like trans women not being in sports. And it was like a transphobic person who got fired from her job because they were asking for like her pronouns or something like that. And she didn't want to say, or she didn't, and she like moral stance about nothing because her job didn't actually care um but she said that she got fired because because her job you know is against her or whatever and so at when that happened after the copy and paste thing then jk rowling started posting tweets in support of that maya person and that's when everyone was like oh you're literally like the worst human alive like before that people were hoping that maybe she just didn't have like correct information and and she could be like swayed but when she started going with that campaign people realized like no you're like a literal like hateful fascist and that's when it was like oh we're done now (laughs) like this is this is completely ruined um yeah Yeah, that was wild since i wasn't super involved with the fandom for me the realization was a tiny bit different so The first realization I had was more like not specifically transphobic, but bigot was um, when she started talking about how there's not just Hogwarts, there's other wizarding schools and there's those wizarding school in America. And then people started talking about, hey, while she's talking about this American wizarding school, she's taking Native American like actual spiritual stuff and she is changing it into magic. And that was the first time where I was like, hold on, wait, this is not the JK Rowling I was told exists. And Mm -hmm. so I was like a little bit like, oh, that's icky. I don't like that. And that's when I started kind of like, I don't know how I feel about her. Um, But then it was the, I didn't find out about the transphobia until the manifesto, which I want to say it couldn't have been too long after that, that Mm -hmm. accidental tweet, because I want to say it was around like, 2016 ish yeah it was right around then because i remember i remember being on twitter then and having online friends then and a couple of us said like after the magic in america which is that thing where she just stole from indigenous cultures um that was when we uh, uh, me and a couple other friends i had we all kind of just said like yeah i don't think i can stomach like buying harry potter merchandise anymore or like going to Universal Studios or things like that because it's now it was like 
too ruined like after that I, I was like at a certain point when I look at something and all I can think about is how horrible the person is who made it I just it's not hard for me to not like it anymore um and that was like the point for a bunch of people when they just like didn't even want to buy like merch or like go to see her any more Harry Potter stuff or anything um and that ended up being like a good choice because things just got worse the more time went on mm -hmm. um but I, I know that that was one thing and that was around the time when um the horrible book came out yeah cursed child cursed, cursed child yeah, yeah uh, and it's, it's weird to remember how all of this stuff was going on when rick riordan was just being rick riordan uh, <laughs> like oh. um her transphobia stuff was going on when he was putting out magnus chase <laughs> yeah that's all that needs to be said about him <laughs> yeah and it's just like wild like gaps of of people oh my god but yeah that's it's wild to remember that that when he's coming out with a book series where almost every character is trans she's going on transphobic rants on twitter every single day and making people cry because of how sad they were that this is who she actually was yeah it was, it was a very disappointing time to um because we wanted more franchise at that point like that mm -hmm. was after all the movies were done and there were so many of us that were hungry for more and so she shot herself in the foot at the worst time for that because it really seemed like they were building up towards like oh we're gonna do more things with these other schools and stuff like that but because there was such an immediate negative reaction to the american magic system and magic school i feel like luckily it got shot down before it even started yeah. um Oh, yeah. also that like magic in America thing. She had one magic school for all of the United States. Yeah, that's so <laughs> <weird>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I saw the video of someone put up today talking about how do kids in Scotland get to Hogwarts because everybody has to take the Hogwarts Express, but the mm -hmm. Hogwarts Express goes from London to Scotland. So like, are they going back to London to go to Scotland again? <laughs> <laughs> it just is so stupid it doesn't make any sense yeah um. <laughs> but like what's what's interesting to do as a um as a reformed harry potter fan i guess is what we can call ourselves is to go back and see how some of these things do tie into the lore of harry potter a little bit mm -hmm. and then you're like oh there was there was a hole in this lore for a reason <laughs> like um very much so and um like all of the problematic elements of her personality are so much easier to pick out in a reread now that we know who she truly is yeah and like just when you get down to like the bare bone like this is the biggest i think analysis where you compare harry potter to percy jackson and it shows who jk rowling and rick riordan are as people the most is how they use well also how they use like the chosen one trope like harry is the like an aggressive chosen one like he's literally like a baby he didn't do anything mm -hmm. and he's told since he was 11 years old that he's supposed to save everybody that's such a hard thing to to try to understand and like people just talk about it as if he's just gonna do it and they won't tell him anything about how he's gonna do it he just knows that literally everyone he ever meets he's supposed to save since he was a little kid and in the other way is Rick Riordan hates obviously the chosen one trope the other day Becky was like talking about how she hates the chosen one trope and I'm not surprised for her to say that because Percy is like the opposite of a chosen one trope because he gets to make the choice there's a whole choice about who the prophecy is going to be about it's not just going to be about him if he doesn't want to do it he's not going to do it end of story and that that's it and so he chooses to do it himself and it takes him a couple books to get there and it takes him really the first three books before they're hundred percent sure that it's going to be him. Um, so it's the opposite of what most of the chosen one tropes are is he is offered that world makes, lets him decide what he wants to do. But the, the bigger one that I thought too, it's how they end up using their chosen one status in the end. Yeah. 
Yeah, because with with Harry, it's very much like a the problem isn't that there is too much power in leadership; it's who's in charge. So oh. if we change it out for all the good people, then we're fine. I know what I was gonna say. The big thing is Harry Potter is very much like a white liberal dream. Yes. Like, and Percy Jackson is a reality. Like Harry Potter is Voldemort is the problem. There's something wrong with Voldemort. He was just born wrong. And there's nothing that anyone could have ever done in the history of his life to ever save him. They make up some like crazy love potion nonsense to try to give it like a magical excuse. And it very much reminds me of true crime people who try to gaslight themselves into thinking that people are just born serial killers. Like, no, they go through lots of abuse and trauma that never gets helped. That's how people end up being serial killers. That's the only reason why that happens. But like Harry Potter tells you, no one could ever save this person. There's just something off and wrong and bad about him. He is the only problem in this entire world. Mm-hmm. It's not the world itself. It's not the government that lied to everyone and scapegoated a child and told everyone that this child was lying when he was telling the truth. And it's not any of the other people involved. It's not the government as a, an entire system. It's not the school. It's not Dumbledore. Everyone else is great and everyone else is wonderful. It's just Voldemort. And if we kill Voldemort, this one singular person, everything else will just go back to normal and everything else will be fine. And like Harry and Hermione and Ron, no, they don't have any trauma at all that they need like decades of therapy to deal with. They're just immediately fine and get married and have a, and like punch out a bunch of kids and name them really weird names. And they're absolutely, (laughs) and they're absolutely fine. Everything's fine because Voldemort is on. And he was the only problem that existed. It's like the people who think that if you vote, no matter who you vote for, that magically every problem we have in reality will just be fixed because you vote. That's not what voting does. But anyway, but like Percy Jackson, on the other hand, is like, no, this is like a systemic issue. This is generational trauma that has literally been going on for thousands of years. And me, Percy Jackson, I know that this is bullshit because my mom loves me and I also see how they like treat people and how they gaslight me and how they scapegoat me and how they treat me. And I tell gods to their face that they can do better. And so instead with Percy Jackson, he's like, I can't fix everything myself because I am one person. There is no way that I could fix every single problem in this world. And you know the entire time from the first book on that it is the God's fault that all of these things are going on and that these kids are victims. And so when you get to the end and he has his scapegoat generational trauma moment where he uses his power to help everyone else and to help the gods actually take care of their kids instead of ignoring them, it's and that is like the reality of how these things actually work. You can't save your entire family or your entire world just as one person. That's not possible, but you can do little things along the way that creates like a ripple effect that makes other people feel like they can stand up and do things later on that will make change happen more and more and more. That's like how that actually happens. And so like Percy Jackson is like reality. Like, yeah, everything isn't fixed. And like the books that are coming out right now, Percy questions whether he should have done more because he's not sure if he did enough to help everybody or not. And yeah, that happens. I have like crises of faith on a break every time I see my my sister and my niece I have a, a crisis of faith about should I be doing more should I be saying more is my niece actually okay will she be okay in the future if she's not okay in the future is it my fault because I didn't say or do something more right now like it's totally normal to feel like that in Harry Potter it's just like yeah everything's great I'm never going to question every decision I ever made and everything's just going to go back to normal as if none of this ever happened yeah and like, it's just literally the last line is and a scar never hurt again like <laughs> yes like what are you talking about yeah. like i that's just crazy and it just shows that's who those two people are like one of them actually cares about people and one of them doesn't and lives in like a fantasy world where everything is that easy to be fixed yeah um, like people who believe in like fascist ideas live in a very black and white sort of world that's where all their conspiracy theories come from is this idea that every problem in the world would be fixed if one person is killed or one person is taken down or whatever like jk rowling literally thinks that if she saves 
like women from having to compete against trans people in sports that like something amazing will happen to society. Um, that's the only reason why she's doing all of it. She's obviously wrong about that. Um, she's trying to protect people from being abused by people who would never abuse them. And while she's concentrating on all of this, women and men and non-binary people are being sexually abused in different ways by different people. And she's doing absolute jack shit to help any of those people. Mm -hmm. instead of focusing on the people that aren't hurting anybody and just want to get through life without somebody killing them by the time they're 30. Yeah. And so like, it's just, that's like the biggest way to compare the two of them. And it's just, once you see that, you can't unsee it. Like once you see that, you can't take it away. Like that's part of like most people's um, like huge, just, I don't know the right word, unhappiness when it comes to how Harry Potter ended is that everything was so simple and that it was just like, how is it possible that this huge complex story is ending in, in like this, in such a simplistic way? Like people came, the reason why fan fiction is better than the actual story is because the fan fiction talks about all the complexity of everybody involved. Mm -hmm. And like, even just to get like, I didn't, this sounds weird, but I didn't really like Sirius when I read the books originally, like I was sad that he died because he was somebody important to Harry, mm -hmm. but I didn't really like him because it felt like he was trying to pressure Harry into doing certain things because he wanted Harry to do it because of his own baggage. Yeah. And it was like putting a lot of his own stuff onto Harry. And it, it felt more like he was talking to his dead best friend a lot of the time instead of actual Harry. And I didn't like that when I read that. And so I didn't, I didn't like him that much, but like those things in like fan fiction and stuff were like dealt with, but that stuff never even gets brought up because that is way too complex of an idea for JK Rowling to ever consider. Yeah. Yeah. Like one of the last things that Sirius ever says to Harry is like, nice job, James, when he does a nice one. I don't know if that's just the movie memory. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's <laughs> the books too, where he does like yeah, a oh, nice job, James. Um, so like literally his very last moment is, you know, projecting James onto Harry and, mm -hmm. um, it is really sad when you think about it. That is something that should have gotten resolved, especially because he is supposed to be a father figure. That's why the fandom says that Remus is a better father figure than him in he some is. respects. That's yeah. why Remus was the only adult that I loved throughout all of Harry Potter, basically. The other ones would kind of go up and down, but I loved him so much because he actually was a good dad to Harry. Mm -hmm. He was the only person that was forced out of his job and he actually helped Harry a lot in Prisoner of Azkaban and came back later and wanted to help him and wanted to tell him things, but just was stopped by other people, like literally forced to stop by other people. And I remember I was sad when he didn't go with them, even though he should have stayed with his pregnant wife, like in the last book, because mm -hmm. I was like, he's actually a good dad and he would actually take care of these kids and he would actually protect them and talk about them and talk about how they're feeling when nobody else does that in yeah. this whole book series um everyone else is like terrible um when it comes to just not only him but like how they treat everybody like molly is like your mother and and my mother a bit when i was reading these books for the first time too i hated her um when i read these i never liked the weasleys the way that you were supposed to because they watched him be abused and were just like i don't care and I was just like, that makes you bad people, just to be sure. And and also, you know, one of the first things you ever see Mo Molly do is scream at Ron mm -hmm. um, at school in front of everybody. Yeah. And I'm just like, that's actual abuse. Yeah. And it, like, that's literal verbal abuse. That's not even like a like a thing you can really argue about. That's that's abuse. Knowing that your kid's gonna be embarrassed like that in front of everybody because you're upset at them. Deal with your emotions. You're the adult talk to your child in a calm way where they're actually listening to you instead of wanting to embarrass them for making you look bad mm -hmm. like that's all that was and me as like a teenager going through that kind of stuff at home i was like ah, i hate this woman <laughs> and it always very much confused me why anybody liked them and it still does like to this day i'm just like what do you like about that family like yeah they're poor that was nice but other than that they're not the nicest people most of the time yeah, I mean, we're meant to think that Percy Weasley is a bad 
kid because he doesn't agree with all of them when like Dumbledore just like four years in a row kids almost died on his campus the fourth time being holding this huge triwizard tournament where people historically have died and like then he starts saying that Voldemort's back like yeah of course a normal person in that universe is gonna think Dumbledore is insane and like yeah. why are we listening to this old crazy man yeah yeah like I always I had the memory I have from when I read Goblet of Fire is like somehow still in my memory it's amazing when I remember any, anything from when I was younger especially when I was a teenager and like living around my dad all the time but I do remember when I let read the end of Goblet of Fire and like Cedric dies in front of Harry and then he almost dies and then he goes back to Cedric's body and has a mental breakdown because he's dead and then has to listen to his dad having a breakdown because he's dead and then gets taken into another room and almost gets killed again by like Moody who's not actually Moody who's mm -hmm. um that other character whose Party. name I forget and then at the end of that book, when they make him go back to the Dursleys, I remember like being in the library at school and I just started crying. And I remember like flipping through the pages to, and like realizing that that is where the book ended. And I was like, you cannot end this with him having, after going through all of that, that he has to go back to his abusive family. I was like, for sure, you're not going to make him do this anymore because Voldemort is back and is looking for him and is trying to kill him. And I could not believe that she was making him do that again. It made me cry so much because it was just so horrible. That's why people started talking about it so much. And it doesn't help that in the beginning of Order of the Phoenix, he's literally laying on the ground outside of a, a window outside mm -hmm. in like the bushes trying to listen to the news to find out if anyone's been murdered yeah because he's terrified that Voldemort has killed somebody and he doesn't know about it yet and it was just like a horrible thing of it's like if you it's like if at the end of Titan's Curse which I won't be specific about since we haven't reread that yet mm -hmm. if just like getting to the end of that book everything that happens in that book and then for Sally to show up and be like oh I got married to Gabe again and you can't go to camp anymore and you have to come here and stay at home with me all the time mm -hmm. and it just would be like the most horrific thing that would have ever happened at that point to Percy and his life that he would be stuck in that situation again after everything he goes through in that book and it, it would just never happen because like that book loves like Percy as a character and they wouldn't treat him that way but it just is such like a harsh way to treat your own character that you say you love, but you treat them like garbage. So it's like, can you really love them that much when that's how you, and it was, I think the thing that should have been a clue, but we were all too young to realize it back then. It's just how she like honest, obviously didn't think that we would have that sort of reaction. Like yeah. we didn't think that people would get so upset by Harry having to go back to the Dursleys. And had to come up with a reason for an excuse for why, because I think she was surprised that we even were upset about that. Yeah. And that's it's, just like. <laughs> it's almost like a moment of why are you questioning me? Yeah. Like, how has this never come up to you before? Um, I remember like years ago on here, I made a video once where I said, like, I realized that the reason why I never liked a lot of characters in Harry Potter is because I was an abused kid growing up and I had to read a story where the abused kid was told that they were too angry and they should stop being upset and was constantly forced to go back to his abusive home and so many other people like that were in the comments being like that's why I never liked that book series <laughs> and I was like yeah I didn't it didn't completely click until now but that's definitely why I didn't like it it was I think that's why I still love the character of Harry is that I, he was like the only character besides like characters in Roald Dahl books that was like actually a, an abused character and was like going through it in the moment. And so it was in the Roald Dahl books, his, his parents die and he like goes on fun adventures without them. And yeah. that's every book he ever wrote and which is why I've read all of them. Um, yeah. But like in these books, it's the opposite. And it was just so hard to read that. It felt like somebody telling you like, no, you should be happy with what's happening to you. You should stay here and not try to leave. Why are you upset about this? You should be grateful. Yeah.
and it was just a horrible like thing to tell kids about that stuff yeah and meanwhile we have in the percy jackson series the abusive household ends after the first book sally puts an end to it the moment well actually i think in the books he's curious and he opens the package himself right or something the show does that the tv show had him kill himself in the book she kills him and sells his statue so that she can be an author (laughs) yeah so like but either way gabe is taken care of after the first book percy does Mm -hmm. not have to go back to a house where he's working during his summer to pay for Gabe's gambling thing. <laughs> like yeah uh, yeah and so it's it's kind of interesting how Rick Riordan was able to take like that trope of like oh well this um, this abusive thing is somewhat of a protective measure and be like okay but fuck that protection once you don't need it anymore um yeah, yeah. and like JK Rowling almost set it up so that Harry has no other option like the fact that the kids aren't allowed to do any sort of magic outside of school i get that that's protective but there's an element of like being able to do some self-defensive magic once you know like that that seems like it should be allowed no matter what age you are maybe like there's a certain number of spells that you can do but like you can't do a, like higher spells she could have made the system different is what i'm saying well and like the thing that I think of too is the idea of consent. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lot of consent in Percy Jackson and there isn't any in Harry Potter. So like one of the things I remember saying a couple years ago is like, why didn't anyone ask Harry what he wanted to do? Like, this is his mother. It's his mother and it's his life. Shouldn't somebody ask him what what he wants? Shouldn't they ask him like, this is something that we think might protect you if you stay at the Dursleys. Do you want to stay there? It's like the absolute bare minimum if you mm-hmm. see children like human beings is to ask them what they want in their own life. Yeah. And that never happens in Harry Potter. She never even thinks of that. Of like, And it's just a crazy thing that all of these adults are supposed to be the people you look up to and none of them ever think to just ask him what he wants. Where in like Harry Potter, And like Percy Jackson, people are always asking Percy that stuff of like, are you sure that you want to do this? Are you sure you want to go to camp? Are you sure you want to do the prophecy? Like we just read Sea of Monsters. Chiron, that entire book is trying to dad him. And is like, I want you to stay at camp and not go anywhere because I'm afraid you're going to get hurt. Please just stay here. Please, please, please. Because I don't want you to get hurt. And that's like a consistent thing through the books is people are worried about him and they're asking him if he's okay. And they know that he has to do these things, but they don't like it. And they're telling him, if you don't want to do this, you don't have to. And it's like that just general, just like basic idea of consent is there in that story where you compare that, like in Percy Jackson, you don't like the gods because they don't treat people like that. They don't ask their kids what they want. They don't treat them like they have an opinion about anything. And so you don't like them, but that's just how everybody is in Harry Potter. And it's such like a small basic thing to ask a kid like what do you want to do but it like but you're just treating them like a human like you would anybody else and when you have a kid yourself like jk rowling did at the time and you're writing stories for children i honestly don't know why you would write stories for children if you're not going to treat them like that and especially the core demographic of these books like that 9 to 13 ish years old that's when kids need the most flexibility. I'm raising an 11 year old, you know, like he needs the flexibility to be able to be like, I want to do this with my day. I want to be able to do these things at school. Um, yeah, it's so what's interesting too about taking away choices and any sort of consent from Harry is that a, I mean, a keystone part of the hero model is the refusal of the call. You know, like the hero has to have that moment where they're saying, do I really want everything in my life to change or am I going to actually take this on? And it can be short. I mean, like Frodo's is very short. Frodo's is a quick, like, I don't want it here. You take the ring back before he's Mm -hmm. like, okay, yeah, maybe I am the person that needs to do this. Harry gets, you know, he has chosen as a baby by somebody else. 
we kind of get an illusion of there could have been another chosen one with Neville, but it's not like he could just be like, hey, Neville, I don't want to do this anymore. It's your turn. Like, um, so there, like you said, there's no choice. And yeah, it takes out a really popular and almost integral part of storytelling for uh, heroes. Yeah, and well, it makes your hero character like an actual person, like an actual character. Because mm -hmm. nobody is going to be able to handle that all the time. Mm -hmm. They're going to have crises of faith. They're going to be like, how can I do this? How is it possible that I could even do this? I might fuck this up somehow. And I don't want to be the one to hurt everybody, but I'm not sure what to do. And nobody will tell me what to do. And I was scared that I'm going to let everybody down. Like, that's a totally normal thing to feel when you feel like all these people are depending on you. And so having Harry... He has those moments, but not really like he has those moments, but he's like told not to have them. Like people get mad at him when he has them, like in Or the Phoenix and stuff. That's basically an entire book of him having those sort of moments a lot. And people tell him that he's wrong for being upset and he's wrong for questioning stuff and he's wrong for being angry at people. And he's completely with he should be upset. Like, I don't know how he shouldn't be upset with what's going on with him in that book. And so it's like he's not allowed to be that. Like, Ron gets mad at him in the last book. And it's like, you don't know what to do. And it's like, he's 17. He's 17 years old. He's supposed to be your best friend. And he, his, like, person that would never tell him anything just died in front of him and left him with all of these questions, never told him anything, and just told him what he was supposed to do, but never actually told him anything of how he's supposed to do it. And now he's just like left trying to figure that out. And you as his one of his best friends is constantly making him feel bad about himself because he hasn't figured it out enough. And it's like, if you feel stressed out about this, how the hell do you think he feels yeah. knowing that all of this is up to you? Like, I cannot even I cannot even fathom like a reality where like Grover or Annabeth would ever make Percy feel that way ever, even when things were as bad as they could be between Annabeth and Percy because of the Luke stuff and like the fourth book and some of the fifth book. There's none of that ever. They're still very protective of him. They still want to help him. They're trying to come up with all of these plans to help him. They don't want to tell him about the whole, he might get stabbed to death part of the prophecy until it happens. And even when it happens, like Annabeth is like shaking because she's afraid of how he's going to react because she knows how horrible this is. Like, they still want to protect him from everything, even if they have problems with each other because of all of the stress they're under. I just can never imagine a version of Annabeth or Grover or anyone else even, in even the other kids, like, even, like, somebody like Clarice that sometimes argues with Percy. I can't imagine a character like Clarice even coming up to him and being like, you're taking too long to figure everything out. It's like the opposite. They want to help him because they know how hard this is. And they yeah. keep asking him, like, are you sure you can do this? Are you sure you don't want somebody else to help you? All that kind of stuff. And it, that's like how it's, it sounds so pathetic, but it's literally because it's like the bare minimum of yeah. treating somebody with like basic levels of respect and like just like personhood is to just ask them if they're okay instead of just forcing them to do this stuff because you want them to do it. Okay, so we've to do it. <sighs> okay, so we've touched on the people. We've touched on the lore. I'm trying to think what else. We've also touched on the fandoms, although I think more could be said about how Rick interacts with his own fandom <laughs> as like a contrast to JK Rowling. Um, because like, I mean, A, he doesn't necessarily interact with this fandom too much which automatically is a level of protection from, you know, like shoving a foot in his mouth, like <laughs> JK Rowling seems to do. Mm -hmm. um, but also the fans that he does interact with, you you see very clearly where he's at, how he feels about like <coughs> this thing that he's given people. I feel like I see it when he talks to the kids because the kids were mm -hmm. fans before they were, um, before they were the actors in the show. And so seeing him talk to them about like, these are stories that those kids read and loved and that he wrote, it's a very different interaction than I feel like you would ever see JK Rowling ever have with anybody. 
Yeah, like we we did our huge our big episode we did about like grooming and stuff and we talked a lot in there about how we feel like our responsibility to like if kids come to us because we make this sort of content for help of any sort we want to be able to help them and and we want to be able to be like a good resource for them and things like that and that's him on like a huge scale like (laughs) i sent you like that link to him writing those emails to the producers for the movies of the first movie that he he put those out on his own blog in 2018 um because he was just like fed up with life (laughs) with like those movies i'm sure at that point but every single one of those of those are like i see kids every day and they're all going to be really disappointed if you make this movie too old and too sexual and all these things and he's really upset about that he's like i want kids to be able to watch these movies and enjoy them and love the stories that they already love and that's yeah. like you can see that in the show as well that that's like the focus of like i want the people who love these stories to love them to love this thing and like relive like the excitement of when we watch this stuff we read these things for the first time or like kids reading those books for the first time to be able to see it and enjoy it he like sat, sit there and like yells at those producers basically in a really nice way but he's absolutely dragging them to to hell in in like those letters being like you're a horrible writer you're terrible at job why are you doing this in my books stop it please before i kill myself (laughs) it's basically those and he's doing that because he feels like he has a responsibility to do that because he cares about the kids that love his stories and he wants them to be happy and it's just like he cares about his audience like everyone in his audience he cares about everybody he wants everyone to be happy his freaking wife is on social media And literally half of her account is just like debunking weird rumors that show up online. Like the other day she, when people started talking about D23 stuff, Becky posted something about how like, oh, we don't have to, it's funny, we don't have to figure out contracts for actors until we actually have to start filming. And I had that in the back of my mind, like, okay, so they're probably not going to announce Thalia, even though I want them to, they probably no. won't because she said that. That's her way of trying to tell people. Like when the like spoiler sources posted all of those casting calls, and it's particularly the Allison one, she posted something being like, you know, um, you know, things may not like seem exactly how they're putting it. You'll understand and enjoy it when it comes on screen. We would never okay any of this stuff if we thought that it would hurt the story or the characters that you already love. And like, that's basically what they use that account for is to have like that. The other other day on thread, she asked people, what kind of merch do you want to (laughs) buy? And I like responded just being like, I like the kind where it's like not obvious that it's like merch from a certain thing. It's like, I like the kind of, um, actually, a lot of the t-shirts that come out recently on Hot Topic is like that, where they're like things involved with the with the story, but if you didn't know the story, you wouldn't know what they're from sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh yeah, I like stuff like that too. And I also rip all the tags off of all of my shirts. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. Like, because I said, like, I like like comfy stuff that is like a reference that you would only know if you actually know the thing. But like, she's just sitting there asking them, like, what kind of merch do you want us to make? <laughs> and it's, there's like such like a direct like talking back and forth between them and us like that it that it's just obvious respect between both sides goes back and forth like we respect them a lot and they also respect us a lot and they generally want to know what we think about things and want to ask what we think about stuff so that they can improve it Mm -hmm. um like we haven't talked about d23 stuff yet but they brought like everybody (laughs) to this panel which they have like never done before. And it was very obvious that they like brought all of the series regulars and brought anyone that they could involve because they said like during the panel, like we're like a family and we wanted everyone to be able to come instead of just the main three kids. And that just shows like, they're even thinking about like, we want all of the actors to feel like they're involved in all of this. Mm -hmm. And that's just like basic levels of respect for people that would happen when the people that are like the driving force of this thing are two teachers yeah um that have kids that are neurodivergent (laughs) like the other day becky posted something about something or other like an article about um a camp or something like that meant for like neurodivergent kids 
And the way that she put it was like, we sent our kids to this and it helped them like not walk into walls all the time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is like a neurodivergent thing is we like have spatial awareness. Yeah. And it was just like a place to help ki neurodivergent kids with spatial awareness. But it was just so funny the way that she put it was like, we don't live in Texas anymore, but we sent our kids to this so they would stop walking into walls all the time. But it's just very much like, like you would imagine like your if we had good parents <laughs> yes. are like parents helping everybody with advice that's basically what like Rick and Becky Riordan are and they're the driving force of everything and so that's how everyone engages with each other like I think that's why like our grooming mm -hmm. stuff had like really nice views and stuff on YouTube for how small our YouTube is and things like that because the fandom is very open to hearing new ideas and learning new things because the people in charge of it are two teachers who want you to learn and grow and understand these things better. It's not an environment where they're like, this is the canon of the book and you can't think anything else. And if you do, you're a delusional weirdo who thinks incest is cool. Like yeah. nobody would, it, they would never say that. And they, and because of that, a lot of like the fights between like fan, different groups of fans with different characters don't really happen like that because Rick Riordan would be sad if he saw you saying that and nobody wants to make him sad. Yeah. <laughs> write a full blog post about like, hey, so here's what's going on with this character and here's what's going on with this character and that's why. Yeah, yeah it could be very yeah. cute. Instead like, there's people posting being like, I want Rachel to be black so that so that it doesn't become like a weird racial thing about which one Percy's gonna choose. Yeah. Seriously. <laughs> Um, but like going back to the letter, um, so we'll have to remember to link it on YouTube, but like the, there's two letters that Rick Riordan wrote when the production of the movies was coming out. One was before he read the script and one was after. And the one after he read the script, as you said, is super scathing. Like there's lines in there, like, even if you were to ignore the book series as a whole, the story sucks. <laughs> and here's well, why. Like, he's been, um, once again, like in, uh, a, like a, a teacher because yeah. he lists off in like paragraphs Annabeth is a problem and here is why Percy is a problem and here is why this is a problem and this is and like six and then sent them a 12 page document where he used his red pencil and like wrote out and like all of the notes he had of all the mistakes they, 12 yeah. pages of no yes that like that is that is Rick that's what he's going to do mm -hmm. um that's his like Aries moonness coming out in full force. That's what we do. We tell people that they're ruining people's lives in a very blunt way, but also in a way that surprises them a lot of the time because they don't expect us to be that honest about it. But that's who he is. He cares so much about his audience and the thing that he's made that, mm -hmm. well, like when you, th I, I, I think that that is something that should make people who are afraid about the TV show feel better because like he fight he he would fight like disney out in a parking lot if they tried to make him change the story of any of his characters in a way that he didn't want them to like yeah i i i always remember like the article where he talked about when they were doing like the medusa stuff and disney wanted it to be like a wholesome thing where percy would like like his dad better and he's like no he finds out his dad raped somebody and yeah. that's what that's what Percy finds out in that episode that his dad raped a woman and she is now like stuck with this way forever and is seen as like a villain when she's actually a nice person and things like that. That's that that's that episode. It could have been a completely different and Disney wanted it to be different. And I'm sure something like that happens in almost every episode. And Rick tells them, no, go fuck yourself, because yeah, yeah. he did that when he had no control, like those those emails that he sent the producers for um, the movies, he had no creative control. They didn't have to get his okay for anything. And he still sent them 12 pages of notes of things that they needed to fix anyway, even though he knew that he had no actual pull, he has that at Disney. So like, just like imagine the shit that he is saying to the writers and to Disney in general to get them to be like, no, this is my thing and you're not messing it up anymore. And like, yeah. it's obviously paid off because it's the biggest show that Disney Plus has had this entire year. 
it was funny watching the D23 stuff for all the Marvel things before they did their huge panel and just watching it and being like, we made more money than all of you. Like all of you, like all of them, every like Marvel show combined had less viewers than Percy Jackson season one. Jeez. And like culminated together was still less than what we made. And so it's like, they have every, it shows that they have total control now. Like they can tell Disney, we want to send our entire cast. <laughs> we want to send all the executive producers and Rick Riordan and all five series regulars and also like three or four more people <laughs> to this panel that you probably thought would be like four people. <laughs> and, they, and they have to do it because they've made them all this money and they're going to continue making more money. But everything they do is like very with like the fans in mind, like even like the merchant stuff, like the cookbook was a really fun idea for them to do. And like the t-shirts that just came out are very fun and the kind of thing that people like because they're just shirts that say like Camp Half-Blood or like Persephone's like things. Um, I forget the fruit that she has. Um, yeah, or, or like Delphi Strawberry Farm, which is like it's what Camp Half-Blood looks Matt, like right? for like normal people. They think it's a strawberry farm. Yeah. And, and like, um, or like Yancey Academy and things like that. Um, and so they, even with like merch, they could put out like the most disgusting, stupid merch ever if they really wanted to. Every kid who loves Percy Jackson would buy it all. And instead it's the opposite where people are asking them to put out more. <laughs> and they're, and now they're asking us, what do you actually want to buy though? Yeah. <laughs> because they're not going to put it out and make it unless we would actually want it. And they're not going to do tacky, weird shit. Yeah. Like most other people do. Like Harry Potter is, is literally just a cash cow to further JK Rowling trying to kill trans people. That's all it's ever been since like the last book, really. And especially since Cursed Child. Yeah. She doesn't care about the quality. She doesn't care if it's good. She doesn't care about any of that. She just, and she literally says that to, to fans on Twitter. Like I'm getting money every single month from the money that you give me because you like the thing that I made when I was younger before you knew what a horrible person I was. And that's all she cares about. She doesn't care if it's actually good. She just wants it to come out so she can make more money mm -hmm. and then use that money to try to kill trans people. And so like, that's such a stark different, like JK Rowling says, let's anything come out, Harry Potter related, anything at all. It doesn't matter how bad it is because she doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. I think I only saw one of the magic beasts. <laughs> I'm I, I like watching like, YouTube videos of people yelling about those movies because of how bad they looked bad already but they were even bad in like a special way like that the like asian one asian person that's in the whole franchise turns into a snake and is like nagini the whole time or something i was just like and like so the whole time that's like an asian woman yeah that feels that feels really racist yeah Oof. yeah and that's yeah. like one of the things that happens but um <laughs> like Rick said over and over again in his letters about the the movies that like he was the one talking to fans like they didn't know what the, they didn't have a pulse on the fandom fans were asking him about the movies he was trying to hype them up but didn't know much about them and so you just know nowadays with like how the show is going he's like oh this is actually a fun conversation yeah it's way more fun now and like he's care like the great, the best example to show how much he cares about it all is in one of those letters, him literally telling them, like, he X'd out, like, the movie they were talking about, but he said, like, fans tell me I don't want them to change the story like they did in this movie. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about, like, the producers of that movie and how they adapted something else and nobody was happy about it. And so he's telling them straight to the producer's face, like, these are literally what my fans are telling me. I'm not, I'm not, like trying to act i'm not trying to kiss your ass i'm just telling you the truth of what my fans want and this is what they should get because i want to because they're my fans i want to make them happy um, yeah and it's, it's kind of funny too how many of those points we hit when we were watching the movie yes i was like oh so we agree on everything 
<laughs> because it very much is like this is nothing like the books this is nothing mm -hmm. for the fandom aging up these characters makes zero sense at all and those are literally all the points he put he's like there's too much sex and why are they teenagers and stop it <laughs> yeah there's too much sex why are they teenagers why is grover like a nymphomaniac why is Persephone like sex trafficking people with pearls that aren't even in Greek mythology? Like, I like how he ends it with this. This isn't even in Greek mythology. So like, why are you doing that? Why is there no Ares? Like, why is there no Ares fight at all? That doesn't make any sense. Why oh, not introduce Ares? Why go to like Nashville and all of these other places and have these other fights and not include things that actually happen in the book? Like, those are all like very valid questions that we ask, and I'm sure every everyone else who ever watched that move those movies ever asked, of like mm -hmm. why wouldn't you put those things in there that just doesn't make any sense? Yeah, um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, he called it in that they ruined the storyline so much that the only mm -hmm. way to further the franchise would be to complete butchering it. And we saw with the second movie, not only did they butcher it, but they butchered it so bad it would be virtually unrecognizable by a third movie yeah. had they done one. Oh my God. I thank God every single day that they never touched Titan's curse. Oh my because God. Oh. I think the fandom at large would have like cr cried themselves to sleep for like 10 years because everyone loves that book so much. People are already talking about <laughs> what it will be like when they cast that season and that will happen for at least a year. <laughs> oh the girl power of that season, because that's the season with the Huntresses. Yeah. yeah. Like we, are, I was just talking to a uh, Percy Jackson friend of mine last night, and I was like, I'm not sure that I'm psychologically prepared for them casting Bianca, a 12 year old child that's going to get killed on screen. Um, I, I'm not ready for that. And this is over a year away. And I'm still like nervous about even seeing that happen in front of me. And I don't yeah. know what to do. And we were talking about that. Like, I don't know what to do either about like them casting like Zoe Nightshade and all these other characters that everyone absolutely loves. Nico, like tiny baby, like Nico and stuff. Like we will be so emotionally like connected to all of that because they mean so much that like people will like have emotions just from them being cast <laughs> in the movie in the show much less actually seeing them do anything at all <laughs> on yeah. the show and so um yeah that's just that's what you want like people to be doing is to be like people are like fantasizing how amazing like the future seasons of the show is gonna be because of how well they handled the first season mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that you want to be happening to people fantasizing about how great it's going to be when everything starts going like off the wall with the storylines and stuff instead of like crying and hating their lives like we did when we watched the movies yeah and i mean i love that this this book stands up to the test that all of us have wanted all along. like at least millennials have been saying let's make a tv series out of our favorite books instead of a movie mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. we've always had that mindset and it's actually working for this one I can't say that it, like, Twilight is another one that there's been rumors that they're going to make. Was it an animated series or was it an actual, like, live people series? Dude, Something, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but there's, like, rumors of a new Twilight <clears throat> series, not movies, coming out. And thinking about that one, like, it's not like they're going to go back and make it better because there wasn't a lot missing from the books that wasn't well, in the Listen, movie. Twilight is mormon vampires yes there is only so much you can do when the story is about mormon vampires like <laughs> so the sh other like book series that i absolutely loved like years ago i used to read it during like the worst time of my life so i haven't read i don't really talk about it and i don't i haven't read it in like years um and the author is kind of a weirdo at this point but whatever um the raven cycles books it's called the raven cycle like series it's by maggie steve hotter and it's about a bunch of teenagers all of them except for one mm -hmm. um go to like a like a private school and there's one that's a girl and the other three are boys and um the girl is lives with her like her mom and like her aunts and stuff and they're all like magical like they all do tarot they're known as like the witches in town and so it's a very much like magical realism sort of story 
Um, mm-hmm. But that book series, oh my god. Um, there's, of course, a character in it that I love a lot, Gansey, who's like, of course, the one that is like prophesized to die the entire time. Like, literally five minutes into the book, you find out that he's supposed to die, and you're like, and then at the end of the first book, I'm like, no, why is he my favorite character? Yeah. Um, he has like panic attacks as the books go along and stuff. Oh. But that book series is really, really good. And just to like kind of some of the general idea of it, the reason why people love it so much is because the lo- the, there is like a love story between Gansey and like the girl. But and there's other love stories, actually, there's a gay couple that get together in that in that series as well, too. But the overall big, huge love story is them as best friends. That is like the huge love that they talk about, like the girl character talks about how much she loves these like three boys that she cannot imagine like her life without them. And the whole thing that she knows that Gansey is supposed to die. That's like the whole huge story is they all find out about that eventually and they all are like, how do we save him? And he's like, I don't want any of you to save me. And they're like, fuck that. Like, how do we save you? We cannot like live if you are dead. And so the whole story, like I see TikTok sometimes of like kids wearing like preppy, like private school uniforms and every single time i'll open up the comments and i'll be i'll see like raven psycho fans acting acting like it's like cosplay for the characters and like that book series is one that's been in like development hell forever and that would be a book series that would be really really good as like a tv show because it does need to be told that way to like have you get to know all the different characters and how complicated they all are like because they all are very complex like there's a Ironically, the character that I like the least out of the group of friends is the one that has a really abusive dad. Um, And I like him the least because he takes out the like anger he feels about being poor and having to live with his abusive dad during the first book or so on Gansey when it's not his fault. Mm -hmm. Like Gansey is basically a super traumatized kid like he had a near-death experience like literally died and came back and was dead for like 15 minutes and is like permanently like traumatized by that and he comes from like a super rich family but none of them talk about anything and so like he's allergic to bees he got stung by them and it's and his allergy is so bad that if he gets stung by one of them he just dies and that's what happened to him he got stung by one and was dead for like 20 minutes and his parents like never really dealt with that they just like kind of left him on his own and the whole story of the book is him basically getting obsessed with something else because he's trying to avoid how scared he is of dying again Mm -hmm. and how you there's nothing that he can say or do to like stop that because he's still allergic to them like every second of every day that could happen to him and so i'm like stop yelling at the kid that has horrible insomnia who doesn't sleep because he's terrified of being killed by an insect any day of his life because your dad is beating you like you don't get to take that out on people that are also going through traumatic things that's not fair but those characters are just as complex as like percy jackson people and like so was a, a show like about them or in a magical world the Six of Crows books got like redone by somebody who isn't Netflix and actually did them the right way. That's another show that would be really good as like a full run, like TV show done by people that are actually not idiots. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Because the show that they did on Netflix was not good for them. Um, They deserve so much better. But those are the sort of things that could happen. And this show is I was just saying this to like a friend of mine yesterday and I'm like, this show is basically like showing an example of like what TV could be if people pay attention, like a very diverse cast, a cast that's very happy on set because it's a very healthy work environment where they all feel like they're part of something and they're all included. Nobody is like number one. Um, The number one kid doesn't like throw his ego around or anything like that in that way that can be very toxic. and everyone supports one another and it there's a very healthy back and forth between like the audience and and like the people making it that's like hollywood doesn't have a lot of like um good things happening in it right now like a lot of creativity but this is something that could easily be done again if all the people involved actually care about what they're making yeah 
Yeah, and I think like the best way to summarize how <laughs> far from the original mission that like J.K. Rowling and Rick Riordan, like, well, Rick Riordan didn't stray from his, but J.K. Rowling did. Her original <laughs> mission, it seems like, just as an observation, is maybe to make a book series that is all about the power of mother's love. Because, like, that's ultimately, like, that's the magic behind why Harry is the way he is. It's the magic behind why he survived. It's the magic why he continues to survive. Um, and so her whole thing is supposed to be about true, true, like, fam familial love. You don't feel that with her books, though. You feel it with Rick's books because his actually came out of a place of familial love. You know, the whole yeah. story with his sons and writing these heroes that had the same disabilities. And you can tell how many students are based off of his, or I mean, how many kids in the books are based off of his ex-students. So like, yeah, he actually achieved the like, let me show a parental love to a generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like I feel like Harry Potter wanted to do that and also do the found family thing. Mm -hmm. But Percy Jackson actually does that. Harry Potter, we have to like change things in order to get the found family that we actually wanted to get because yeah, it just never worked like that. Well, and yeah, again, going back to the like weird relationship with her fandom that J.K. Rowling has, Wolf Star, <laughs> like. Yeah, it was the fan family people wanted because there were a couple lines where Sirius and Remus were very clear coded and this idea that there's a reality where Harry could go and move in with his like gay uncles who are going to take <laughs> care of him. We all freaking wanted it. We, we wanted yeah. him to find his family that way, not become part of the Weasleys. Well, and also just the idea that like these four teenage boys love each other so much that one of them is going through something really hard and so they all permanently change their bodies so that he doesn't have to do it alone yeah and that's kind of like what i was saying about the raven cycle books is like when you like that just like pure like love for another person yeah sometimes people will like make it you know more romantic or whatever but it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. um but also like you wouldn't have a problem with them loving that if you're okay with that you know like there's nothing wrong with people loving how much they love each other even if even if you never want it to be romantic who cares like you can still enjoy it like percy and grover will never be like romantic but if people want to write stories about them being like that that's fine because they love each other enough that you could see it happening well, I know a lot of people like to write fanfic of Percy as bi too. So like mm -hmm. they like to think of Percy and Annabeth as a bi bi, but hetero relationship. Yeah. And yeah, like that doesn't sound so far out of place, nor does it seem like the kind of thing where Rick would be like, no, Percy can't be bi. Yeah, he would be like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Like I'm, his next book comes out in like a month or so, and I'm interested to see if he does anything to add that into canon or not because that's just what he does he mm -hmm. takes people's ideas and if he likes it then he'll put it in and every single book since the the last olympian basically he's added somebody who is a queer character in every single book since then so there's going to be somebody <laughs> if it's not percy there's going to be somebody else uh becky riordan she posted this article that she thought she said it was like in line with the kind of stuff that's happening with is going to happen with Luke in season two. And I thought it was interesting. And of course, I had like lots of like thoughts about it. <laughs> um, but it was basically an article where they were talking about the stuff that happens between him and Hermes that mm -hmm. the stuff that you I'll like try to be vague about it because I know that you don't remember it, all of that stuff completely. But it was basically the idea that like Hermes is knows about like kind of what Luke is supposed to do in the last book. And so he stays away from him because it's like too hard for him to be around him and not want to like change his like fate when he knows that he's supposed to do this thing and it's too important of a thing for Luke to do for him to like want to change what it would be. Um, and they're basically like that whole line that Hermes says in the book of like, oh, your parents could be doing things that you don't even know about in the background, that whole thing. 
Um, and of course, when I read that, I was like, that still makes you an outrageous asshole. Just by the way, because like the first thing, of course, just in my life that I think of is, um, I usually cut out when we talk about our own personal lives, but I'm going to make myself keep this because it is a good example. Um, with my sister and my niece that it would be much easier for me and like my mental health if I just didn't see my niece very much when she was growing up, it would be way easier for me. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very hard for me to see her be the ages that I was when I was being horribly abused. And it's going to happen pretty soon. Like it's not a very long time before things like that will have started happening. And so it would be much easier for me to be like, this is too hard for me. I'm just not gonna know my niece. I'm just gonna like not see her very much because it's too hard for me to like deal with this stuff. And then also if things start going bad between her and my sister, it would be really hard for me to see that and to have to watch that and be limited about what I could do and things like that. That would be very difficult for me. But like, to be honest, if I did that, I would be a horrible person. And if I did that, if I stayed away from her just for my own benefit and left her alone, in a horrible situation because of my own shit, she mm. would absolutely be completely validated in hating me. Like, she should hate me. I would have absolutely no leg to stand on to be like, yeah, I knew that you might be in pain, but I just ignored you that whole time because it was harder for me. Like, that is ridiculous. <laughs> and so that's how I see that environment is like, yeah, okay, maybe Hermes did like know that that would happen and he did stay away from Luke, but also you're his dad you should get over your own bullshit and be around your kid anyway even if it is hard for you because you're the adult and they're the kid and that's the literal bare minimum of how those relationships are supposed to work you yeah. deal with your emotions later but you be there for a child that doesn't know any better like luke doesn't know any better like if luke luke doesn't know why you're not around if he he doesn't know that you have like some weird moral thing that you're doing that you're not bothering to tell anybody about. Why would he know that? He would just hate you. <laughs> and so I thought that was interesting because they might try to make me like Hermes, but that will never, ever happen. <laughs> like, we may like Lynn Manuel Miranda, but <laughs> sorry, sorry, Lynn. Like you're gonna do, you're gonna try, but if that's like the route they're gonna go, I'm. I I think they'll keep it more like gray than anything else um but yeah i i oh my god um and then the other thing i wanted to like rant about that's been bothering me is everyone's fixation on walker's puberty yeah. <laughs> so i just oh my god that's it so there's like story behind there's there's things and with like percy jackson that's happened with that always bothers me but just to like start um, just to explain the context of this, I guess, is the the Deadpool movie, the Deadpool and Wolverine movie. I think it's so funny that this came out the week that the internet realized that Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds are dicks, <laughs> because I felt like we were like a little bit ahead of the curve um, because of that. But anyway, so for the Deadpool Wolverine movie, they there's a lot of different Deadpool characters and iterations of him in the comics, and there are all these rumors forever that um walker was gonna play like kid pool or one of those other characters for deadpool because he played a young ryan reynolds in the adam project so well and people loved him in that movie like i have never seen an interview with him where he's being interviewed by like a major publication like entertainment weekly or something like that where they didn't bring that up with him they would always ask him like oh, are you going to be in that movie and he would just be like i don't know um, they, I haven't heard anything about them and they, he would just tell them like, I, I'm not going to be in the movie, but they would just keep asking him. Um, even when he went to the kids choice awards, like right before this movie came out, the person there was asking him like, oh, why don't you call up Ryan Reynolds and get him to put you in this movie? And he's like, oh yeah, because it's that easy for them to do that. <laughs> for me to be in that movie is just to call him up, obviously <laughs> like, oh my God. But they just kept bringing it up. And so after the movie came out and he wasn't that character in the movie um the this article came out in entertainment weekly where steve levy who is the director for the deadpool movies said that the reason why he didn't get that role 
is because of puberty. Like he literally said it was because of puberty. He said that he got too tall and his voice dropped too much where he no longer fit the role. And even though it's a dream of his, we just didn't give it to him, but we were going to give it to him before that, but he just got like too tall and he grew too much. And I'm like, you are lying. Like number one, you are lying. I do not believe this story. I think that enough people asked you about it and you feel bad because Walker is such like a kid still. He's only been in three things, including Percy Jackson, um, four things technically, but like still, he only was in two movies before he did Percy Jackson. He's such a baby actor. He's still very innocent about a lot of it. And so he's this actual kid who just loves your thing and everybody knows that he wants to be in it. There's tons of people that would have gone to see, try to see that movie who aren't old enough to see it, but they would try because they would want to see him in the movie. And so you're just making up because there is no way that I'm going to ever believe that that movie wasn't going to Nepo baby it and have Blake and Ryan's kid play that role because that's who plays the role in the movie is their kids. And Blake Lively plays like the lady version of Deadpool in that movie. And so I'm like, you're never going to give him that part ever because also movies film way before they come out. And so I'm like, his voice didn't drop until the last few months, really. Like the interviews that he was doing at the beginning of the year, he still sounded like he did when he, when they filmed a Percy Jackson, the first season, basically. And so I'm like, he didn't really fully, his voice didn't drop until recently in the last couple months anyway. And so you would have filmed this part with him before any of that ever happened anyway. And I also just have to believe that they were lying because the idea that they called him up at home and told him, hey, I know this is like a dream role that you've always imagined doing and you literally did a movie with us. And so we, th and you probably thought that we would let you do this, but we're not letting you because you had puberty, something that is completely outside of your control. And we're not gonna let you do this movie because you're too tall and you're like too old now. That is just such a horrifying thing to imagine that like a big star director and a big star like Ryan Reynolds did something like that to a kid that was in like eighth grade or ninth grade and just like walked away from that being like, oh yeah, that was a good decision. <laughs> so I have to believe that they made this up because I can't, I don't want the other version to be real that they actually did that to him because that is just horrible to say, to say to a kid at all, just tell them like, oh yeah, your body changed too much. And yeah. that's why, and that's why you didn't get this role. Like, please let that not be real. For the love of God, like, just please let, let that not be real. And so when the, the trailer for the new Percy Jackson stuff came out and everyone kept talking about how his voice was different and people started making way too many jokes about like, oh, they need to hurry up and film Titan's Curse because the kids are getting too old and they're gonna look too like out of character by the time they get to the later books. And I'm like, look, like this show is going to make seasons probably quicker because the writer strike, you know, slow them down between season one and season two. That's true. But also, can I just like state for the record that if anyone involved with this show was actually trying to hurry the process of production along because they were afraid about the actor's puberty, they should be slapped in the face, hit with a hammer, and then also get fired. Because that is honestly one of the most disgusting things I've ever heard <laughs> in my life to imagine that people working with kids would treat kids that way of seeing like their puberty or just them being children, like normal developmentally normal children as a problem. And like the thing that really bothers why this like grates on me so much is I know that sometimes it's supposed to be like a joke. And I love watching like him and Leah and stuff get older. It's fun to watch them grow up like that in like a mom way, you know? And this stuff like kind of makes, like takes away from the fun of that. But the reason why this stuff bothers me so much, and this sounds like a crazy leap, but I promise you it's not. It's connected to how children are abused in Hollywood. Because I'm not saying that anyone is abusing Walker or any of the other kids involved in this at all. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that the way that people treat kids where the, you feel like you are allowed to talk about every facet of their life because they are a public figure 
that is what I mean, that people feel like they can sit there and debate about whether Walker going through puberty is a problem or not when he's acting as a role. Like the fact that you feel like you can make comments about his body, you can make comments about his voice, and you can make comments about him as a person. Like I granted my teenage years were also extremely abnormal in a very different way than his is, but I at least understand how being when you're a teenager and you're going through wild things that nobody else you really know is. So I can say that during my teenage years, I felt like my body was like an alien. Like I didn't like, and I I think that regular teenagers probably feel like that, like that you, you, cause your body changes so much with like hormones and all this shit that goes on for many years when you are in high school, that you already kind of feel disconnected from your body. And because it's changing so much that it doesn't feel like it's yours for a while until you get to like, college age and things start to like calm down when it comes to that stuff and so i cannot like i felt that a lot for really bad reasons i cannot imagine how hard it would be to like see people talking about you this way like seeing like huge stars that you look up to like commenting on your puberty as if it's a problem and then the fans of like the thing that you're doing that is like the thing you've loved since you were a little kid talking about whether you're too tall to play the, the role right or if your voice has dropped too much and now you're not going to play percy jackson right in later seasons because you're going to look too old or something and it's just like how is anybody supposed to handle those sort of i can't even imagine how weird it would be to like log on to the internet and see people just talking about your puberty yeah. experience and i just wish that people would shut up because it's the same thing I always say, but like kids are human. These kids are people. And just because they're good at acting enough to be in a Disney Plus production, does it mean that everything about them is just open for everybody to talk about? And it's just also this idea of like, he is a child. He's 15. He, he is a baby. He is so young. Like when you look at pictures of him he is so young even if his voice like i'm also i'm almost like do you did none of you have friends that were boys when you were in like middle school and stuff because my friend that was a boy did that like in seventh grade we left and then we came back in eighth grade and his voice had dropped like a million octaves mm-hmm. and i was just like oh wow and but that was like basically the end of it because i didn't know any other boys where, where that would happen besides him but like it's a very normal thing for boys to grow a lot and for their voice to suddenly drop like that around that age. Mm-hmm. And so nothing that he's doing is like out of the norm. And it's just, it just feels so weird to watch people talk about this aspect of him. And I'm just like, this has to be the most uncomfortable experience when you're already at a weird age already and feel awkward just existing to have people like, discussing that about you and it's just like that should never even be like on the table that's not something you should ever even feel open to discussing ever there's no reason and it's the whole thing that hollywood acts like kids are like disposable where they feel like they can do and say whatever they want to kids and that nothing will and nothing will happen to them that's why kids go through abuse more than any other group of people because they don't have any power and they don't have it. It's hard to get people to listen to you. And there's nothing that they can really do on their own. They have to depend on other adults around them. So sometimes adults use that to do whatever they want to them. And it's just that whole idea that like anything about these kids are up for you to discuss and, and they just have to deal with it. And it's just like, that's just not how any of this stuff should go. And I just really hope that this fandom that usually is like very empathetic towards their actors because it's run by Rick Riordan like realizes that and stops doing that because they could do that with the other actors too. And I really don't want it to be like that. Like, are they going to do that with the person that's cast as Nico? I really don't, <laughs> I really don't want to see that with that little child either. Yeah. And so like with Walker's voice and how stark that was, because I, I get it. I get that, you know, we had the original trailer, we had the baby voice and now we have the teenage voice. I get that, you know, we had the original trailer. We had either. 
Yeah. And so like with Walker's voice and how stark that was, because I, I get it. I get that, you know, we had the original trailer, we had the baby voice and now we have the teenage voice. Mm -hmm. But for example, I've said Williams 11, two summers ago, when he hung out with these family friends, he was shorter than a kid who was a year younger than him. This summer, He's like a little bit taller than him. It happens really weirdly sometimes. Kids grow at a weird rate. And like, I want to say at the age that Walker's at, it's even more rapid. So um, yeah, and we grew up in the 90s where they had, they were passing off people that were pushing 30 as teenagers in high school shows and in movies. Um, so it doesn't necessarily take away from the experience. Like we weren't watching Grease the whole time saying, why do these people look like they're collecting a pension? You know, like we were like, oh, they're in high school. Um, okay. This is a, a movie. <laughs> oh yeah. And so the person in my comments is saying like, they feel like he embellished the voice a little in the voiceover. And I'm like, yeah, they definitely, yeah. not only him, but like, they probably embellish it with like effects because it's a very dramatic voiceover and it's very effective like the best thing about that teaser trailer besides seeing like the chariot race stuff is just how it shows without being obvious about it how much percy has changed in one year like the first voiceover is hi i'm percy jackson am i a bad kid and in this one it's like i'm percy jackson i'm a demigod and it's just like this is who i am this is what i'm dealing with the gods come after me and I, I like saved the world last year, but everything is about to get like much worse basically. And it just shows just watching those two different trailers, how much like his character has grown in like one season, which is the effect that they wanted. And so, yeah, like his voice did get a little deeper in the last couple months, but it's nothing like crazy. And it just really bothers me that, I don't know. There's been a couple things online lately with him where people have like been posting like clips of him playing video games with his little brother that is like very obviously not something that either one of them would ever want to be public and they're just kind of passing it around and it just makes me uncomfortable because there's no way that they would want that out there and it's just that idea of like privacy that him particularly he doesn't post on social media really unless he has to <laughs> like the biggest clue i had that they might come out with a teaser trailer is that he randomly posted a TikTok video the other day and the caption of it was that i have to post this video so i made my sister film this for me because he doesn't post anything and i'm like okay they're probably gonna post a teaser trailer on his account and they needed him to have something else on his account before they posted it there and because he doesn't post anything like that he keeps his private life private and so I can't help but be bothered watching somebody who very obviously wants to keep his life private, having people out there post it all, all over the place and fans of him keep sharing it because they just like to get to know him better, but aren't thinking about like, where did this stuff like come from? Because yeah. there's no way that he would want a video of him playing video games with his little brother who's even younger than him to be like out on the internet, just being like spread around everywhere for everyone to read. Like it makes me worried about where that even came from in the first place. Yeah. Um, and I've tried to ask and nobody, everyone says, I don't know. It just ended up on YouTube and I can't find it on YouTube. And so I'm like, I can't even try to figure out to like report this to get it taken down because whoever posted it probably did not have their permission. And it's just like what I was saying about Percy Jackson versus Harry Potter is the idea of consent. And I think that that idea goes along with the actors as well, that they deserve to have their privacy. Even if you want to know them, they deserve, it's much better when they feel like they can share things and they can trust their fans with what they share instead of feeling like their fans are like invading parts of their life that they don't want to be out there. It just makes the back and forth between it much healthier. It's the same way that our back and forth with Rick Riordan is much healthier than people have with JK Rowling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that was everything we we said we were going to cover this episode. Hoping for more announcements. We're still we're still praying for a Talia announcement. Mm -hmm. Like 
we we've seen two different speculations on who it could be there's a new one that's a little bit more recent and um i'm just i'm ready to learn who it's going to be because i'm hoping that she is not necessarily a regular but regular enough in this season that we do get that character building of talia um talia annabeth and luke a little bit more yeah and um, the next thing that people are probably going to fo focus on for now when it comes to announcements is Percy's birthday, which is yeah. August 18th. They usually announce, they announce something or other on his birthday first when they were doing season one. Um, they usually do something on his birthday every year. And so if they are going to announce that stuff, they would be, they would probably still be on the first two epi um, episodes when they're doing that. Um, but, mm -hmm. so I always go back and forth of like, who they're going, when they're going to announce Thalia because she probably wouldn't be involved until later on anyway. Um, we just want to know because we're the people. <laughs> but there are a bunch of other people that could be in those episodes that they could announce, like Charlie um, and Selena and mm -hmm. other people like that, like Tantalus, if they, if they have a Tantalus at camp this time. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, they brought out Dionysus at the panel too. That was great. The guy who plays Dionysus. Yeah. Asked, they asked the question, "Are you going to be at Camp Half Blood more this year?" And they said, "Yes." And he ran out on the stage and just started yelling at all of them as if he was a character as Dionysus. <laughs> it was it was great. They were all just laughing. Um, but yeah, literally, they brought everybody who was involved, and so it would make sense that they would have characters like Charlie and Selena and stuff at showing what's going on at camp while they're away to show like the effects of what Luke is doing and Selena being the mole and all that kind of stuff, because they don't need to have everything be from Percy's perspective. And so those people could also be cast and everyone would have so many feelings <laughs> about Selena and sure there's an abundance of so many about those two characters alone. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I could see them, if, even if they don't announce Thalia for a little bit longer still, I could see them announcing those people and everybody crying about them. <laughs> or maybe we'll get a short like teaser video of the kids in their chariots. Who knows? Like, yeah, because especially if that's what they've been working on filming, that might be all the footage they have to show us by the time the 18th rolls around. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, what should we talk about? Should we dive into the Titans curse for next week? Yeah, let's just do it because we've been circling it. Yeah, I love that book so much. It's I think it's so funny that I love it so much because it's such a hard, such a hard book. Um, but there's so there's so much to discuss in there. So it's gonna be so much fun diving into that book. 